Perfect. Thank you. So today I'm going to be talking about learning in, uh, in urban forestry research. And uh, oh, thank you. this guy is my advancer. I can move around. And so I want to acknowledge my co-author, Amanda Sorensen, who is back there. She's a graduate student who has been working with me on a number of these projects. Although I realize I can walk around, so I can just stand in front of my slides and block them from your view. Yeah. yeah, I know I could. And nobody will see anything. Um, so look, it works. OK, so I'm going to start with a, a brief description of a citizen science project that I worked on about, I don't know, very few long years ago. And uh, it was called Flying the Wild and Mesas. And basically, this is in northern New Jersey, southern New York area, uh, around Harriman State Park, if people are familiar with the area. And, uh, and so what we did was we, we were very interested in the spread of, I'm not hearing my voice go in and out, so I don't think there would be a that size. It's not me just slowly going mad, so I'm going to call out again. Um, and so what we did was ask people who, uh, who were hikers to help us understand what was going on in the understory of these forested park areas. And so we were interested in having people look for a certain invasive species. They were weeds, they were bushes, they were vines, they were trees. And so this is the kind of project that I would say is very typical of citizen science certainly not all, uh, where we wanted to sort of grow this ecological data set. Um, and we knew that there had to be a series of measures taken to ensure data validity. But we also wanted to actually get people involved in this such that they stayed. It's like where I'm standing is um, <laughs> Look, learning, this is how it happens, <coughs> through experience. Um, and, and so, what we wanted to do was ensure this cadre of volunteers to help us out for a long period of time. So we figured, A, they had to enjoy themselves. Uh, B, we wanted to see if they did experience some kind of behavior change, especially because one of our funders, the Palisades Interstates Park Commission, gave us money to try to convince people to change their behaviors. And C, uh, part of this was funded through some federal agencies who wanted to know if people actually learned stuff about science and whatnot. I'm breaking everything I'm doing. Um, and so we wanted to measure some of those learning gains as well. Now in a project like this, as some of you may have experienced, there could be a series of tensions dealing with, with the needs of the science, let's just say, and the needs of the participants who are helping us gather the data. Now, again, learning, as you saw with me walking back and forth here, right, it does, you have to allow time for mistakes, a little trial and error. I don't know too many scientists who are like, yeah, go ahead, <laughs> make some mistakes in my data set. Um, so balancing that is something that you need to think about. In addition, uh, these volunteers, are they citizen scientists? Are they citizen technicians? Are they people that you want to just go out for one day? You know, like you may, or are they somebody you might hire, like an undergraduate for a summer internship? Or are these people that were really empowering to do science? And of course, how do you do all this? We're always short of money, but how do you do so when you're also short on time? So, so this project, these were the sort of the learning goals, if you will, that we had for the project, right? We wanted people to learn more about these amazing plants, certainly. We wanted them to engage in some kind of scientific reasoning so that uh, we could see if they could actually, if there was potential for citizen scientists. And we wanted to understand the extent to which these people engaged in environmental issues at large and also in behaviors that would reduce the spread of invasives. So basically we had one day training event before these people went out hiking for the season. So that's what we had in, in timing. And then after they hiked, we had a, a half-day training following the data collection period. So the way we decided to measure learning, we would use questionnaires, right, pretty common. We'd ask people about invasive plant content knowledge, and then they got a series of problems that they could apply some level of scientific reasoning to. And then uh, 
We also looked at elements of what's called the nature of science, or NOS. Uh, typical question being, you know, how do science know? How do scientists know what the atom looks like? So just trying to understand people's sort of broader inferences about the process of science. Then we also had individuals report, you know, the kinds of things they do, whether or not they change their behaviors, their impressions of science and scientists. And so we found that um, individuals develop their content knowledge skills, right? I don't know what I'm pressing here. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> that any more to see? I can, I can learn. And so what we have here is uh, just a series of types of questions we might ask individuals over here. We have their pre-scores. And think about this as sort of an, like an, an exam that you may have had at high school or whatnot. Here's a percent score. And then here it is, post-participation. And oh my goodness, right, there's increase. This is just showing you the change. And so overall, on average, about a 20% increase, which is typical of that you might see in an undergraduate class, say. And so yes, people, six months following participation, retain some knowledge about these invasive plants. Now, when you look at things like scientific reasoning, and again, um, you know, to what extent do scientific theories need to be based on data that are visible? That's sort of getting at, and there's a series of questions getting at this kind of data positivism. Like, do you need to see and touch the data, or is there a role for inference? How certain are scientific claims? Um, how often do the, the bulk of scientific claims change? To what extent do scientists rely on experiments? To what extent should they share data with the public? These are all kinds of examples from this broader instrument that we use. And so the pre to post, you're going to see uh, that uh, there just, there wasn't that much change. And why would there be? We had one day of training. What was more alarming for us was that um, people did exhibit strong data positivism, right? So the idea of models or using an inference to kind of suggest we know something was completely underappreciated in this group. Um, how certain are scientific <coughs> claims? Folks said, like, not at all certain, right? Um, how often the bulk of claims change? We had numbers as high as 75% of the time, which is really high. I mean, we know lots of things are changing, but I'd like to think the bulk of scientific knowledge is not changing 75% of the time. And this was over a five-year period, right? So that, uh, to what extent do scientists rely on experiments? Again, solely is what people thought. You only do experiments to understand science. D sharing data with the public, there's a big question of sort of why would we do that? And so these individuals, in terms of their views of science, would, would be considered, say, less accurate than if you sat here and asked these questions of a group of scientists. I should say these individuals, the bulk of these people did have college degrees. Um, the bulk of them did take some science courses in college. And then when we asked some of these open-ended kinds of questions, like I, I showed you before the example, um, it, when it came to kind of making errors with separating causation versus correlation, and that's also a percent correct. So about 25% of the group was able to do that correctly. Um, so that meant 75% of the group were making some real errors in separating causation from correlation. Um, in terms of controlling variables, so the kinds of questions where you'd have to hold one thing constant to look at some other things, about 50% of the group um, struggled with that. Now that being said, I prefer the positive angle on this, which is that 25% of the group really could handle some sophisticated causation, correlation type of problems. And uh, when it came to things like controlling variables, about half the group could do that with no real training on our project for that. So that's the positive end. <laughs> um, you know, about 11% of the group reported a change in how they viewed science. And, and that was largely in this view of scientist. Um, so they said things like, scientists can be normal. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, thank you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and uh, when it came to engagement, however, we got that kind of typical response of many citizen science projects, right? We'd do this again, it was fun. When it came to behavioral change, and I probably shouldn't say this to this particular group, but uh, that was very modest, and indeed, <laughs> Several people were more likely to plant invasives because now they realized there was no controlling them anyway. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> we did a really nice job of, uh, of dealing with that. So, um, oops. But uh, when it came to uh, issues environmental, these are kinds of 
things that we often look for and from an environmental education type perspective, concern for the environment, knowledge about the environment, awareness of civic situations, self-efficacy. Uh, in all those cases, we didn't really notice a great amount of change in a project like this, and especially the latter. Their ability to enact change, which I was getting at a little bit with the invasive, that we almost always see changes, because uh, we think it's more of a psychological phenomenon where people want to say, I didn't just participate in this for nothing. But our group did say that, so uh, <laughs> when it came to dealing with the problem. So, uh, <laughs> sure. We teach people things, they can know things when it comes to kind of this targeted instruction. Reasoning skills and how they think about science, and just because we're showing them our science, that doesn't change so easily. And when it comes to people actually doing things different and living their lives differently, that's slow. And that has a lot to do with lots of things, not just your project. So, but, <laughs> you know, they did collect meaningful data and that, you know, is a separate talk altogether, but that the data were validated and they were able to, to be used to build a model about the prediction of spread of certain invasive species. And, uh, but if we're gonna deal with this nature science or these broader things, we probably need more than a day and a half. Um, but some things to really think about in this type of model of citizen science is do they care? <laughs> a whole bunch of them turns out, we're like, I don't really care if I learn science or not. Um, while 25% of them, if we're hoping they're the same 25% who could do the controlling variables and the re causation versus correlation kinds of problems, came to the table really well equipped to do so. Um, but, you know, a lot of them were just happy to get at something Karen mentioned earlier, to just volunteer. They didn't care about what or what they learned. They just wanted to do something good for a day, they were hiking anyway, leave it at that. But then the question we ask is, could this sort of traditional citizen science model um, serve as a gateway for maybe groups that are a little more engaged, that maybe we have them for a bit longer, we can do more stuff with them? So, oh, in wax, um, kind of a different perspective on citizen science than that which we held before. And in this project, which we're working on right now, the question of sort of why engage these people, what do we really have to benefit beyond the data set alone, and what do people really have to benefit from this, uh, moves beyond just knowing more, right? Let's think about the system in which people are living in, and we're calling this a social ecological system, and we're really talking about this biophysical system merged with the social system, right? And we're asking, can communities become more resilient, right? Do they have a better capacity to respond to perturbations, to respond to change. And then um, with this kind of community capacity that we might seek to build, is there a role for learning in citizen science from that perspective? So a resilient community of this nature would be one that can retain its critical functioning, right, in times of environmental, political, economic, other types of social change, for better or worse. Can they monitor, right? Can they cope and adapt? And more importantly, can they thrive? Which is something that we often forget to ask. And of course, there, there are a number of threats to resilience from both the environmental and ecological sense. So with this model, we created something called collaborativescience.org. There's a number of people that have helped with this that I'll acknowledge at the end. But basically, this is a cyber-enabled citizen science program where we're giving people tools to not just participate in the programs that other people are engaging them in, but in this context, to actually start programs that they want, right, in, in areas of need. So, for example, we worked with Virginia Master Naturalists who do have a strong capacity for monitoring and advocacy. These are people that got a lot of spirit, they have a lot of knowledge, they just don't know what to do with it. And so there was some frustration in working on other people's projects all the time, and they had questions of their own that they wanted answered. So join collaborative <laughs> science, we said. In one case, uh, we see people were living by a series of streams. They were very concerned about downstream water quality in a particular lake near folks, where folks were living in Virginia. And they were noting a lot of these kind of zones where the cattle were just sort of standing right there and had access directly to the water. 
They also uh, reported pretty high coliform counts downstream, as well as a number of other water quality parameters. Total suspended solids were high. And they felt, though they did not have a lot of evidence for, that this might be affecting fishing in particular. So they used some of the tools we offered them, agreed to sign up in the project, and basically agreeing to sign up meant they agreed to allow us to record their conversations and whatnot so we could understand a little bit more about what they're learning. And they designed a study. And, uh, and it really was a little bit of consult from experts, so now it's a totally different model of citizen scientists. Right, where these guys are just calling up scientists and saying, give us your advice for about 10 minutes instead of working for a scientist. And so they set up a water sampling protocol. They grew bacteria on di and petri dishes from stuff they got off of Amazon. So this is really, you know, bottom-up type science. And basically had enough evidence to convince the soil conservation district in that area to give them a $200,000 grant to work on stream bank remediation, right? So that's a pretty powerful example of what people can do. <coughs> and so when we look at those learning metrics, which we did again, there was a change, right? Significant increase across the board. Yes, they knew more about riparian zones, they knew more about ecology, on and on and on. But what was interesting is they also had an increase in confidence, right, to advocate to actually do something on their behalf using data. And we saw some changes in data literacy. So we're seeing little by little changes, not these broad changes that some of these programs will report where it's like, learn to reason like a scientist, come work with one for a day. But these people, through time, becoming more comfortable and more experienced with data. So the next question we ask is, okay, these master naturalists, if you've ever worked with them, or master gardeners, or different groups, really motivated, really want to do stuff. But they're not always in the locations where we, we think we need some environmental remediation or change. So what happens when we move to an audience like West Baltimore, it's a highly urbanized system, and we don't have that capacity in terms of people coming together to <coughs> raise funds, to buy stuff from Amazon, to begin doing studies, and that kind of thing. And so in particular, we worked with a series of neighborhoods um, in West Baltimore where there was a lot of poverty, a lot of boarded up homes, uh, a lot of disenfranchisement, um, and, and a lot of urban disrepair. And there were colleagues of ours, a man of mine, that really wanted to understand more about the Asian tiger mosquito and spread of this invasive mosquito in this urban system and really focused on these unmanaged container habitats, right, in these neighborhoods where there's a lot of trash, which is just like luxury hotels for these kinds of mosquitoes because it has, like, you know, just perfect amount of, of like low levels of water that dry up and come back and so it's, it's just excellent habitat and they really can breed these guys really well, as we learn. Um, but these, these, there were just not enough people to be able to go block to block, container to container to do this kind of work. So, hence, you know, adding to our collaborative science network, a group called Mosquito Stoppers, right, working with individuals in these communities. And, uh, and now, again, we're looking for this, we're looking at capacity, we're looking at what people learn and how they can use what they learn to change the system. But here, we're talking about a group that at least on its outset, did not have a great deal of agency. They did not feel like they were able to make choices or take actions. However, post-participation in this project, we saw an increase in, in the belief, right, that personal and community actions do have a broader impact, at least within that community, right? So people were seeing the effects of their own work and discussions and community building within that community. So, you know, for many of us it seems like, sure, why wouldn't they? But for these guys it was a pretty significant and pretty surprising finding for themselves to learn that. But, okay. And uh, there's also, we found sort of a decrease in satisfaction with the local municipal government. Um, you're both giving me times. Okay. And so, um, uh, and so 
that's you know unfortunate. <laughs> but maybe we stir a little unrest. Maybe there's more greater rise to action. Uh, and then uh, we did see, however, an increase in personal responsibility. There's a greater link between what people felt like they were doing and how that impacted the environment that surrounded them. But also, <laughs> there was a great deal of enthusiasm, and that we were a little worried about. You know, you're asking people to go out and collect invasive mosquitoes, right? So how fun can that be? But it turns out a lot of fun <laughs> on the part of a number of these individuals. A and just the community building that they felt like they were a part of. And so we saw maybe there is this capacity for agency to change. But of course, does this monitoring continue when we leave? Will they continue to advocate for themselves when we're not standing there bolstering them up? I don't know. And does this actually result in, in ecological change? <coughs> I can tell you that very quickly, by giving support to the community, and this is a different community, but I'm giving you the kind of example for that type of support, in this case with the schools, we see that, number one, learning can happen in the school. This was a student's model, <laughs> which is exciting, right? Now, they don't always I don't always believe that, but uh, of what's happening with mosquito, right? In the beginning, uh, us just working with the teacher for a couple of weeks on the citizen science project in the very same way we work with the communities in Baltimore. And this is our model post participation. And so you may not take this change as evidence of learning, but if we really looked at it in more detail, um, I, I would say it definitely is. And we're seeing this continually, right? So great. <laughs> The teachers are invested in learning. The teachers really, really want to see learning, so we made them happy. But having these kids work in the capacity uh, of doing this sort of thing with community members turns out to be a great kind of collaboration for individuals to start thinking a little bit more like how we think as scientists, right? So we saw. Number one, these kids were, were using evidence to support or refute claims, right? Yay, that's really high order scientific thinking. Um, and it enabled us to kind of think about linking data and models, but it also enabled us to sort of think about why it was people came out and did things for us in these types of projects. And so that really helped us to learn more about what we need to motivate participation in our projects sort of subsequently. And so these kids ended up testing a model where they plotted things on a map and then looked at GIS overlays and started working with some individuals in the community to ground truth some of these models using these GIS overlays. So again, moving from something that's rather simple to something rather complex in a very short period of time. So, you know, in terms of building this community capacity, is there a role for citizen science? I would say yes, right? We saw it, the opportunity for agency to develop, for a deeper epistemic type of practice, and that's what I'm arguing is, is the kind of learning that matters, right? Because that's the kind of learning that can feed back into how we operate in a system. That's the kind of learning that managers and, and people who actually take ownership over the resources use to say, all right, what do we need to be do doing differently? As Phil said in his talk, that adaptation this is the kind of learning that can promote adaptation beyond, yeah, 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 they get a little bit more about invasive plants, or yeah, 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 they get a little more about this or that, right? <coughs> and so I in this manner, uh, I argue that citizen science does build the potential to promote learning, but also in the case of if we're looking at some of these uh, <coughs> systems outside the window here, if we're looking at urban forestry across the U.S., this kind of community science or this community practice it gives us an opportunity to look at what the community derives from these kinds of points of engagement and how you can feasibly sustain that beyond, hey, come learn something new for a day to you know, part and parcel of what it is we do every day in our lives, like making it part of just something we, we take into account and something we think about. So you know, does this make, mark meaningful change on an ecological level? We're still measuring that. So there's a ton of people who help me with this stuff. Um, and to acknowledge them, 
you know, all individually, but, uh, you know, Dan Betts is here. He's also been helping me deal with a lot of transcribed data and whatnot, so that's been wonderful, the funding agencies, et cetera, and I may have time left. No, I think I'm good. Oh, you're my good? Okay. Perfect. Um, we worked with folks down there, but the folks down there were working in primarily in different spots in the city. Um, and so how we got these individuals involved, I mean, it's not easy, but we did a few things. Number one, we were present in the community for community events, for uh, you know, when people were having block fairs, when people were having neighborhood association meetings. <coughs> when people gathered, we gathered too. Is number one. Number two, we worked with people we knew who were leaders of the community. So usually that took about, it really took us like maybe 15 minutes to figure that out. If you're at one of these events and you start talking and start mentioning something to somebody, they mention a name of somebody else who then mentions somebody else and then we realize very quickly they all start mentioning the same name until somebody comes up to you and is like, yeah, I'm, I'm the one everyone looks to. You know, so, uh, um, once we talked to people like that, that really helped us to further network because then they were able to say, you know, if it was a pastor, hey everyone, be sure to show up on Sunday or something. If it was, you know, somebody who's just ran a popular store, you know, don't forget to go do this. If it was just somebody who hung out on a particular stoop often and just word got around. So those were probably the two best ways to get people to at least turn out. Giving them stuff always helped. So from the federal agencies, sometimes we were able to incentivize with a little bit of money, uh, food. Um, but if you don't have those things, and we didn't always, what we found was child care. So if there's, if there's a neighborhood event or something, and you have stuff available for the kids to come and hang out with so that adults can go chat with their friends and things like that, then the kids are sitting here, and we're giving them sources of information and things like that. And then the parents come around. And then the kids can also push a little bit at home to do something for various prizes or, you know, we promise to talk to some teachers in the schools. It's hard in a system like Baltimore, so the teachers in the schools turn over so much. And a lot of agencies and organizations and after school programs and nonprofits turn over, turn over, turn over. So we really wanted to work with people who are nested in that community, who are present, and that was more community leaders, and often they didn't have they were not associated with the nonprofit. They maybe knew people who were, but these were people who were living right there. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.